Well, we give you a very warm welcome to our morning meeting. It's good always to gather together, even though we don't gather together in person. We gather together in spirit, and we gather together around the Word of God. So let us all pray, dear friends. Our glorious and eternal God, the great God of heaven and earth, the one who is our Father in heaven, we bless you that we can come to you this morning because of the Lord Jesus Christ, because of the one who is the way, the truth and the life. And we thank you, O God, that he is that unique way, that only way to you. And Lord, we bow in your presence. And although we have distance separating us, we thank you that we are united in Christ and we are in union with him. We thank you, Lord, that we are members of the body of Christ of which he is the head. And we thank you, O oh God, for every true believer who is meeting with us today and pray that by your Spirit he may take up the things of Christ and he may make them known unto us. We bless you, Lord, for the word of truth. We thank you, Lord, for the greatness of the gospel and the wonder of salvation in your Son. And we pray, O oh God, that you will have mercy upon our poor world we realise, O oh Lord, that it is struck down with this terrible virus. And one day, Lord, may it please you to remove that virus from our globe. We look to you, O oh God, and pray that in mercy that you may come. We pray indeed, O oh Lord, for your people. We think, Lord, of out there, O oh Lord, in the Philippines, that preacher's uh, seminary and O oh Lord our God we do pray that you may bless uh, the preaching of your word there and that you might use it to the building up of preachers we know that they will not be meeting in person but we know that they will be meeting on zoom and we do pray Lord that all that is done may be for your glory and for the edification of the body of Christ hear us O oh Lord we pray in Jesus name Amen. Now I'd like to uh, draw your attention just for a few moments this morning to a little statement that we find recorded in Matthew chapter 24 and the sixth verse. Now the Lord Jesus is speaking here of his second coming and he warns the disciples uh, that there, there will be trouble and tribulation before he comes in power and glory. And he says in the sixth verse, You will hear of wars and rumours of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. See to it that you are not alarmed. The Lord Jesus gave these words of encouragement to those disciples before he went back into heaven. He wanted them to be strengthened, in spite of the fact that they would live in an uncertain and in an unstable world. The AV translates this statement, See that ye be not troubled. See that you don't become agitated. That you don't become anxious. That you don't become f confused. You don't become alarmed. Troubles are coming. But meet those troubles with courage. Endure those troubles with patience and ultimately commit every situation to your Father who is in heaven. The world will be in trouble and the world will be troubled but we are not to be troubled because we know that ultimately God is working his purposes out. In a sense he reminds them that they are his sheep that they are his servants and that they are one of his children. All things that concern us are ultimately appointed by the infinite wisdom and by the great love of God and that we are safe in his hands, that ultimately the eternal God is our refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms, that we are to always remember that he is with us and will be with us till the end of the age. And all trials, 
will be moderated so that ultimately every believer will be able to bear them. And there will always be the all-sufficiency of God's grace to meet every trial. And therefore he really encourages them in that statement to watch and pray and to guard very carefully against anxiety. We are to believe God's word. We are to claim God's promises. We are to seek in our uncertain world at this particular time with this terrible virus to walk close with him. To know what it is to dwell under the shadow of the Almighty and to know more of the love of Christ that passes knowledge. And if we have fears, we are to bring those fears to him, knowing that he's ready to hear us and ready to relieve us. We are to cast all our care, all our anxiety upon him and we are to leave them in his hands. And we are to expect help from him and remember that we are always one with him, that we are members of his body of which he is the head. And Jesus is saying here that there will be uncertain days before the second coming. And who knows, it may come in our lifetime. For every day is a day nearer the second coming. And we are in a day and generation where there is uncertainty and there is a great deal of sorrow. Many have lost loved ones. But we have the greatest security of all, for we are safe in the arms of Jesus. Those who are listening here and who are believers long to meet together again, long to be able to embrace each other, long to be able to shake one another's hands, long to express our love for one another. It's an old saying, absence makes the heart grow fonder. And I pray that that will be the case with us. I know that our brother Doc can't wait to get back. She's itching to get back. She's chafing at the bit to get back. And I know that many others are as well. But meanwhile, we have to rest in the present situation. And we have to rest in the promises of God. And rest in the glorious certainty that God is present with every one of his believing people. There was another occasion when the Lord Jesus talked to his disciples and tried to encourage them about not being troubled. He says in John 14, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the place where I am going. Let not your hearts be troubled, for we do have a hope that is far greater and far more glorious than anything this poor world has to offer. And we have a glorious a sure and certain hope. And we have a wonderful future. And as one of the old Puritans put it like this, that this life is but the womb of eternity. And what a glorious future we have. And how we should encourage one another in these days. So let us all pray. Our glorious and eternal God, the great God of heaven and earth, we realise that we do live on uncertain days. We know, Lord, that the early disciples did too. We realise, O oh Lord, in AD 70 there was a terrible fall of Jerusalem, a terrible massacre. And, O oh God, in heaven we know that there was awful persecution of your people under Nero. Many of them were thrown to the lions. Many of them were set up as flaming torches around Rome and they did not deny their Lord and Master. And we live in uncertain days. 
But we do pray, Lord, that by your grace that we may rest upon your promises and that we may walk closely with you. We know that Noah walked with God in a difficult day and we know that Enoch walked with you in a difficult day. And we pray that we may do so too. And we pray that we may bear a testimony to those around us. Fill our hearts with compassion. For we know, Lord, that many have lost jobs, many have, many, many have lost loved ones to this terrible virus. And we do pray, Lord, that we might ever be on the look and ever be on the watch for those who need a word, an at word from us. Grant us help, we pray, Lord, for opportunities to present people with the glorious gospel of the grace of a loving God. Do hear us, we ask, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now I'd like to draw your attention this morning to a very well-known portion of God's Word, to Genesis chapter 28. And we're going to begin reading at the 10th verse. Genesis chapter 28, and beginning to read at the 10th verse. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth, with its top reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants a land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on it. He called that place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear, so that I return safely to my father's house. Then the Lord will be my God, and this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house, and of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. I want you to imagine for a moment that you are Jacob here. You're on the run from your brother Esau. Isaac had told you, your father, to go to Param, Padan Aram and to seek a wife from the daughter, one of the daughters from Uncle Laban. You had taken away the blessing from Esau, your older brother, and Rebecca, your mother, had encouraged you in this, and you had gone and made out that you were Esau in order that you might get the blessing. You took the food, the game, and you prepared the tasty food and you went in and you had gone out to the flock and two choice goats had been taken and food had been prepared, hoping that your father would give you the blessing that was due to your brother Esau. You made out that you were him. You knew that Esau was a hairy man and therefore you covered yourself with skin, with a goat skin. 
and you bought the food. And Rebecca, your mother, had taken the best clothes that Esau had, and you covered yourself with those clothes, and you took upon yourself goat skins, because you know that your, your brother Esau was a hairy man. And you went in to your father, and you said to him, I am Esau, your firstborn. And you told your father a lie. Rebecca had encouraged you to do it. And it was that Isaac had given you that blessing. He thought that you had the voice of Jacob, but you managed to persuade him that you were Esau. And Esau comes in after you've got the blessing and he too had prepared some tasty food and brought it to your father Isaac. And Esau was told by Isaac that he'd given the blessing to your younger brother Jacob. Esau had a grudge against you and said in his own heart, when the days of mourning of my father are over, then I will kill my brother Jacob. Rebecca was told about it. And you heard from your mother, your brother Esau is consoling himself with the thought of killing you. Now then, my son, do what I say, flee at once to my brother Laban at Haran. Stay with him for a while until your brother's fury subsides. And when your brother's well, no, brother's no longer angry with you and forgets what you did to him, I'll send word for you to come back from there. Why should I lose both of you in one day? And Isaac called you and blessed you and told you to take a wife for yourself from among the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. And so here you are, on the run from Esau. Here you are full of fear and trepidation. You don't know what the future holds. And you're now about 60 miles from Beersheba. You're very sad at the prospect of having left home. You're still a young age and you really were mummy's boy. You really were mum's favourite son. For in her eyes you could do no wrong. And sadly your mother Rebecca had encouraged you to do wrong in taking away your older brother's blessing. There was a great sadness now of leaving home. But at the same time, you had the consciousness of knowing that you had your father's blessing. And there was a mixture within you. There was joy and there was sorrow. And there was also fear, all mixed together. What would happen if he saw my brother gets me? That will be my end. And you come to this place and you stop for the night and you are absolutely knackered. You're absolutely weary. And you take one of the stones and you use one of the stones there and you put it under your head and you, la you put your head on it for a pillow. Not the most comfortable pillow to put your head on but you're so tired after your journey. And you don't believe that night, and you don't, re sorry, you don't realise that night that you're going to have the surprise of your life. You have a remarkable dream. And what a dream it is. For there is a stairway, a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching heaven. And you see the angels ascending and descending upon the stairway. And then you see something of the Lord, of the great God, 
understanding. And telling you who he is. I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants a land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth and you will spread out to the west and to the east to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised to you. What an amazing sight. What amazing words. What great encouragement. If you wake up and you're shaken to bits, and you say, surely the Lord is in this place. And I was not aware of it. And you're gripped with fear. How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. And then you take a stone that had been placed under your head and you set it up as a pillar and you pour oil on it and you call the place Bethel House of God even though the city used to be called Lass. And then you become a wheeler, dealer with God And really God could well have struck you down for this. Or you try and broker a deal with the great God of heaven who you had just seen something of in your dream. If God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's house. This is my deal, you say to God. Then the Lord will be my God and this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. I'll give you a tenth back. If you will do what I'm now saying to you. You don't realise what impudence that is to try and procure a, God, a deal with God who has revealed himself to you quite remarkably in that amazing dream. Now there are several things that we can learn from this this morning. The first question we need to ask is who would be the descendants? There will be a great number. For in verse 14 it says your descendants will be like the dust of the earth. Well, you can't count the dust of the earth. And you will spread out to the east and to the west, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. That's an amazing statement of the most amazing grace to a most unworthy man. And the incredible thing is, my friends, that if you're listening in this morning and you are a believer, you are included in that statement. For Paul the Apostle, writing to the believers at Galatia, says this in Galatians 3.29, If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to promise. Right down through the generations there will be a spiritual seed. Right through the old covenant there will be a spiritual seed. 
And right through the great days of the gospel, there will be a spiritual seed. And every true believer will be part of that remarkable promise given to Jacob prior giving, prior having given it to Abraham. And we are part of it. And what an amazing privilege it is to be there. And then we can say this, that this stairway, the authorised version has ladder, most Hebrew scholars would say it is stairway, came to where he was. Exactly where, it was, where he was. And the Lord Jesus makes reference to this stairway with regard to Nathaniel in John 1 and verse 51. Regarding Nathaniel, I tell you the truth, you will see heaven opened, open, and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. And no doubt when Nathaniel was told this, he would no doubt have thought of this encounter that Jacob had at Bethel. Not necessarily would he see with his physical eyes, but he would see the evidence that it was so. Heaven opened. What a remarkable thing that was. Heaven was opened. And above it was the Lord. And when heaven is opened, it's always often a sign of God's remarkable favour. In Psalm 78 and verses 23 and 24, we read these remarkable words. Psalm 78 and verses 23 and 24. Yet he gave a command to the skies above and opened the doors of the heavens. He rained down manna for the people. He gave them the grain of heaven. And when heaven is opened, it's a sign of God's favour. Heaven opened in the coming of the Lord Jesus, a sign of God's remarkable favour to this world. Angels were present with the Lord Jesus in the wilderness. We know that in Mark 1 and verse 13. We know that an angel came and strengthened the Lord Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane in Luke 22 and verse 43. We know that there was an angel there when he rose from the dead. What a wonderful and remarkable thing this was. We have a picture here of the glorious person who would be that great stairway, that great ladder, the glorious person of the Lord Jesus. Now the next thing that we can say about this is that he comes to messy lives. Jacob was in a mess. He was fleeing from his brother Esau. It was a terrible and it was an awful mess that he was in. Messy lives and dealing with people in messy lives is God's speciality. You think of the messy situation in the book of Esther. There's no doubt that Esther had an immoral relationship with the king. And there was a death sentence passed on the Jews at the request of Haman. And God came in and God dealt with it. And the king could not sleep and he woke up and he wanted to see the minute books. And you know the story well how that Mordecai is brought through the, brought through the city by that wicked man, being led by that wicked man Haman. How that God turns the tables out of a most messy and terrible situation. 
God works through it without any way condoning sin. And I wonder how many of us, if we were in Jacob's shoes, with a strong-minded mother like Rebecca, how many of us would not have done the same? You think of the mess that David made with Uriah the Hittite and how that he premeditated his murder and then adultery. What a mess he was in. And yet God specialises in dealing with messy lives. You remember how that Nathan went to David in 2 Samuel chapter 12. He went to David and he had to say to David, you are the man, you are the man. And David said, I have sinned against the Lord. And we know Psalm 51. But how gracious a word is given by Nathan to David. He's convicted of his sin. And Nathan said, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. And there were ongoing consequences. But because by doing this you have made the enemies of the Lord show utter contempt, the son born to you will die. But the biggest mess was the mess of Calvary. And it was through the mess of Calvary that God accomplished a glorious salvation so that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. The mess of an unjust trial, the, the mess of horrendous violence, the mess of mocking an innocent man, the mess of mob rule, the mess of a spineless pilot, the triumph of self-righteous religion. And through the mess of Calvary, and through the horror of Calvary, God saved his people from their sins. And friend, you may have a messy life at the moment. Your life may be in a complete mess. Perhaps through someone else. And through your own folly. God in grace. In wonderful grace specialises in dealing with messy lives. You see, Jacob's problem, and your problem is this. He was living for himself. He wanted that blessing for himself. And sin is man living for himself. That's what happened back in Genesis 3. Man lived for himself. And the problem with the world is that man lives for himself. Sin has a, a the eye in the middle. Man living for self. The wonderful thing is that in grace... He's able to come with, come to you and meet with you as he met with Jacob. God's undeserved kindness. Jacob didn't deserve this visitation. Neither do you and I. Esau should have had the blessing. So he should. What amazing grace. What a wonderful promise. God says in verse 15, I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I, what I have done, until I have done what I have promised to you. It's all on the basis of grace. And the same grace is available to you this morning. However old you are, however young you are, Come to God and say, I've messed up. I've lived for myself. I've had self-interest. That's why I'm in a mess. I thought that 
I went out for pleasure. And like the lost son in Luke 15, I've come to myself. And I'm prepared to say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. The wonderful thing is that before the lost son had time to say it, the father embraced him. He's ready and willing and able to embrace you this morning as you are, where you are. You need to come and you need to own up. Children often have a problem with owning up, don't they? Adults do too. And sometimes in a court of law, when a person will declare themselves not guilty, they see all the evidence weighed against them and they change their plea to guilty, hoping they'll get a lesser sentence. Recognise that you're guilty and pray that the Lord Jesus will save you in your messy life. You see, the wonderful thing about the Bible is it never whitewashes its heroes. It never glosses over the imperfections of its heroes. You look at Abraham, it never glosses over. And God deals with messy lives. Into the mess of Jonah. And God met with him in that fish's stomach. God specialises in messy lives. And and Jonah made that great statement in that fish's stomach, salvation is of the Lord. And that statement sums up the message of the entire Bible. Oh, that you will be saved. The only one that can save you is God through the Lord Jesus. You need to pray that you will be saved this morning. You may be watching this on the internet. I pray that you'll be saved this morning. Messy life, however messy it is. Let me tell you, the Lord Jesus is willing and able and ready to save you. And then you notice Jacob's response to the dream. It made him fearful. enabled him to say surely the Lord is in this place and I was not aware of it how awesome is this place now that word awesome is a word that is commonly used today and it shouldn't be because it only speaks the, the meaning of the word is with reference to reverence for God and what he does This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. And when Jacob put his head on that stone that night, he had no idea what was going to happen. He had the surprise of his life. He saw that stairway. He saw the gate of heaven. And the Lord Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The Lord Jesus said, I am the door of the sheep. He that enters me through me shall be saved. I am the door. I am the gate, as it has in the NIV. The Lord Jesus is the one way, the unique way, the only way to God for those who have messed up their lives. We do not come this morning. But I want to say this. The awesome presence of God is the great need of our day. There was a great preacher, as some of you know, called Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. And on the 1st of March, This year, he would have been in heaven for 40 years. He died on the 1st of March, 1981. And somebody once asked 
Dr. Lloyd Jones, why don't you greet the people? And this is his reply. They're not here to meet with me. They're here to meet with God. Now that's partly right. We are here when we come, and we hope we're going to come one day very soon to meet together. It's good to meet together as brothers and sisters in Christ. But ultimately, we're coming to meet with God. That God will break through the preaching. And that there will be a special manifestation of the presence of God. My friend James Mansfield at Billing Hay retired at the end of last year. He served the Lord faithfully, and before that, as some of you know, he was at Dawes Heath. And he was brought up at Wallace Avenue Evangelical Church. And he told me that as a boy he could remember seeing people on the pews trembling under conviction of sin. Such was the mighty presence of God. God was in the place and it was an awesome sight. And I would say that this is something, and I do say this is something you can't control. That's a great danger today, that we can bring it up from above. We can't. It's God coming down from heaven's glory. Look at how Paul the Apostle put it in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 4. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. A demonstration of the Spirit's power. And listen to this. This is what they said. Peter and the other apostles. In Acts 5 and verse 32. We are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit. Whom God has given to those who obey him. There was something outside of them. Something extra, something additional. The Holy Spirit. This is a great desire that we should have for the foul presence of God that only he can give. Many years ago, as some of you know, I used to go to the land of Romania and do some ministry there. And on one occasion we went and we were taken in by the police early on in our visit in a, in a town in the south of Romania. And we were interrogated. It wasn't a pleasant experience. I wouldn't go through the details. And eventually they let us go and gave our passports back and we decided not to visit any meetings of the church as we were just visit individual believers. And usually we had to visit under the cover of dark. There was one final brother that we had to visit. He was an evangelist. A powerful Romanian evangelist called Titus. He was a dentist by trade and we brought some amalgam into Romania for him, for his dentist practice. We arrived one Sunday night and he came in full of God. And his uh, dear wife and him had known that we were coming, message had got through and they kept a piece of steak for us. Now, my friends, we had to eat steak and chips at 7.30 on a Monday morning. Not the best time to have it. We told them we didn't really want it because they needed it, but they gave it to us. And as I defined kindness a few weeks ago, I said kindness is giving to somebody else something you need for yourself. And they told us this story that he was preaching one Saturday night just a few weeks before. And so many people came to the meeting. It was packed out. They had to move into the car park. 
They had to empty the car park. They had to move into the car park. And he stood and he preached powerfully in the open air. And he said over 50 people were swept into the kingdom of heaven that night in one evening. No decisionism, no hands up for Jesus, just swept into the kingdom of heaven. God was on the loose. And time and time again, there were stories happening all over Romania like this. God on the loose. 1907, in Pyongyang, which is North Korea today, there was a mighty revival. And what we have with believers in North Korea are descend, many descendants of that revival. Oh, how we need God in the midst. And how we need to plead for God to come in the midst. We cannot make him come. It is his sovereign pleasure to come. And we long that he might be. Remember how Zechariah put it, Zechariah 8 and verse 23, the Lord God Almighty. In those days ten men from all languages and nations will take firm hold of one Jew by the hem of his robe and say, let us go with you because we have heard that God is with you. We have heard that God is with you. All that that will be said of us, even in our day, we have heard that God is with you. Now, a couple of brief things by way of conclusion. A sacred spot. Verses 18 and 19, he called that place Bethel because it was a place where he met with God. There are no sacred spots today. No sacred buildings, the Reformation saw an end to it all. But where is that sacred spot? It is the people of God. When Ephesians 2 and verse 22 we are told very clearly that we too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Spirit. And every believer is the dwelling place of God by his spirit. God doesn't see labels or divisions. He sees the regenerate, those who are born again alone. If a person is a Christian, he's a dwelling of the spirit of God. We are to say no to heresy and no to error, no to liberals. They are truth deniers. No to the cults. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones says in one of his expositions, we are to hate the cults. Meaning by that, not to hate the people, but to hate what they stand for. And then we see Jacob's bargain with God. This is what I'll do. He said your promise, this God, if God will be with me and will watch over me on the journey I'm taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's house, if that's, you keep that side of the bargain, Lord, then you will be my God and this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. That's it. And of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. He's a wheeler dealer. He's a del boy of only, thaw, of only fools and horses doing a deal with God. If you do this, I'll do that. Not only will I do that, I'll give you a tenth, Lord. God could have said, Listen, Jacob, who do you think you are? After all that I've revealed, all the promises I've said, that all peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring, that I'll be with you. Now you want to do a deal with me. If God meets with us where we are. And you know something? All Jacob's conditions were met.
all self-interest was still there in Jacob. And the wonderful thing is, my friends, that God discloses himself to us where we are and as we are. And he wonderfully bears with us because let's face it, none of us has a complete understanding of Christian things. As someone has rightly said, God in his inscrutable wisdom has not been pleased to place all of his truth upon groups of his people. But most groups think he has. That's my little addition. We're all learning. And Jacob had a lot to learn. And we have a lot to learn. One final thing, and here we have a great mystery. And with regard to the great doctrine of election, Paul reminds the believers at Rome what had already been mentioned in the book of Malachi. Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. And the fact that he loved Jacob Sovereignly love Jacob is absolutely amazing. But the fact that God sovereignly loves you if you are a believer is equally as amazing. Why should he ever love any of us? But the incredible thing that he does. And adopts us into his family, makes us his children, and has loved us with everlasting love. They have an eternity in the mind of God was Jacob. And there in eternity in the mind of God you were and I was as believers, if you are a believer. And it's wonderful. It's glorious. And it's amazing. But it's incomprehensible. And therefore to God be all the praise. And all the honour. And all the glory. For he alone is God. And he can do what he likes. And who are we as men to reply to God? My problem is not why doesn't God save everybody, but why does God save anybody? That is an absolute and remarkable mystery. And that is God's mystery kept to him alone. Chosen not for good in me. Jacob could have said that. And every believer can say that to the glory of God. Let us pray. Glorious and eternal God, how great your grace to Jacob was. And how great your grace is to us. And Lord, for those who perhaps are watching this and have a messed up life, we pray, O oh God, that you may meet with them in their mess and save them by your grace. Lord, you specialise in it. Please come down, we ask. And in your great mercy, draw sinners to your Son, that they may see that one who in the mess of Calvary was the Lamb of God, who took away the sin of the world. For Jesus' sake. Amen.